The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is Father John Zulsdorf and another podcast. Today we welcome as our guest Peter Kwasniewski, who authored an article for LifeSite back in May of 2019 entitled, How Vatican II Elevated Worshippers' Active Participation Above Worship of God. We'll hear this article and uh, I'll rant for a while. In May of 2019 at LifeSite, Peter Kwasniewski wrote an article entitled How Vatican II Elevated Worshippers' Active Participation Above Worship of God. Well, it seems like uh, on the face of it that those two things are you know, equivalent terms, especially as they've been treated since Vatican II. They seem inseparable, but we have to make distinctions. Can we distinguish Bene docet, right? He who makes distinctions teaches well. So Peter definitely lays out the issues uh, in his own remarks. So I don't need to go into this too much as a preamble. Uh, however, I would point out a couple of things which you might tune your ear for. First, Peter remarks that Cardinal Lercaro, that's Giacomo Lercaro, made a mistake or blundered by reversing the order of aims or fundamental principles of Pius X's liturgical reforms. Don't worry, he's going to explain what he means. But I think uh, in talking about Lercaro that way, Peter is being kind. Uh, I am not going to be quite so kind. Uh, Cardinal Lercaro was not a dummy. He knew how to read. He had been deeply imbued with Pius X's reforms. He knew what they meant. Um, however, he wound up being one of the principal forces driving the artificial creation of a new form of the Roman Rite, uh, Father Louis Bouillet indicates in his memoirs that that master of machinations, Annibale Bunini, successfully manipulated a Cardinal Lercaro in many ways. Uh, in any event, Lercaro may have blundered, but he did so with eyes open. It wasn't just a mistake in reading the text. I think he believed um, that what he was doing was uh, the right thing to do. He knew what he was doing in reversing uh, these principles. And, he, and Peter will lay all these things out. Also, uh, Peter writes, Note here that Pius X is assuming that the faithful will be assimilated to the spirit of the liturgy itself. What it is, they also will be. What it is not, they can never become. Okay, now that is a key point made by Dr. Krasniewski. And uh, I'm going to comment on that afterwards uh, at length. So let's hear now uh, the article that was from LifeSite in May 2019. Gloria How Vatican II elevated worshippers' active participation above worship of God. Historian Yves Chiron, in his best-selling biography of Annibale Bunini, notes the rising popularity of a phrase, today more likely to elicit the rolling of eyes, that was bandied about in the 1950s and 1960s. The active participation of the faithful in the liturgy was one of this period's recurring themes well before it became the watchword of reform that Vatican II envisaged. In September 1953, Cardinal Lercaro, Archbishop of Bologna, made it the theme of his keynote address at the International Meeting for Liturgical Studies at Lugano, Italy. Active participation, the fundamental principle of Pius X's pastoral and liturgical reform. Two years later, he published a diocesan liturgical directory for Bologna with this meaningful title, A Messa Filioli, Direttorio Liturgico, 
per la partecipazione attiva dei fedeli alla Santa Messa Letta. To Mass, my children, liturgical directory for the active participation of the faithful at low Mass. This directory is circulated widely. As an author myself, I am often struck by the discrepancies between positions attributed to authors and the actual positions held by the same authors upon a closer look. Pope St. Pius X was held aloft as the author of this mantra, Active Participation, but was Cardinal Lercaro, or any of the lesser lights who said the same kind of thing, actually being faithful to the thought of Pius X? In the motu proprio tra le sollicitudini of 1903, Pope Pius X called for a reform to sacred music, not in order to bring it up to date, aggiornamento, but precisely to move it away from the fashions of the day, Italian operatic style church music, which was very au courant, and back to a healthy condition characterized by music truly suited for the liturgy, which he identified as Gregorian chant, and music inspired by and compatible with it, such as Renaissance polyphony. Before he lays down specific rules for sacred music, however, Pius X first enunciates the general rule that motivates and justifies his actions. It being our ardent desire to see the true Christian spirit restored in every respect and preserved by all the faithful, we deem it necessary to provide before everything else, for the sanctity and dignity of the temple, in which the faithful assemble for the object of acquiring this spirit from its indispensable font, which is the active participation in the holy mysteries and in the public and solemn prayer of the church. As usual, with older papal documents, the wording here is exquisitely crafted so that each idea fits into the whole in its proper order. The purpose or final cause for Pius X's reform is to see the true Christian spirit restored and preserved. This, he says, against the backdrop of a Europe ravaged by anti-clericalism and encroaching secularism. He then identifies the means by which this purpose will be achieved. First and foremost, before everything else, the sanctity and dignity of the temple must be provided for. All that conduces to the holiness and nobility of Catholic worship has to be put in place first, so that the second step may occur, the faithful assembling there to acquire the Christian spirit from its indispensable thought. The active participation of the people, a phrase used here for the first time, is not portrayed as the goal or end, simply speaking, nor has it priority over the soundness and fittingness of the worship. Put more simply, the end is the true Christian spirit. The means are twofold, the public and solemn prayer of the church itself, which ought to be correctly done with sanctity and dignity, and the active participation of the faithful in that prayer, so that its spirit may become theirs. Note here that Pius X is assuming that the faithful will be assimilated to the spirit of the liturgy itself. What it is, they also will be. What it is not, they can never become. Now, compare the above text to another one, this time from the Second Vatican Council's Sacrosanctum Concilium of 1963, 60 years later. In the restoration and promotion of the sacred liturgy, this full and active participation by all the people is the aim to be considered before all else. For it is the primary and indispensable source from which the faithful are to derive the true Christian spirit, and therefore pastors of souls must zealously strive to achieve it by means of the necessary instruction in all their pastoral work. It cannot escape our notice that this text turns things on their head. Where Pius X had said that what should be provided for before everything else is 
the sanctity and dignity of the temple. Vatican II says that the aim to be considered before all else is full and active participation by all the people. In doing so, it inverts the hierarchy of goods. Now, the worship of God and its right condition becomes secondary to the people's involvement. The activity of the faithful is to take priority in liturgical reform and conduct. In practice, we know what this led to. The holiness and nobility of worship, done for God's glory, suffered grave damage because all attention was focused on getting people involved in ways both legitimate and illegitimate. Instead of placing the objective good of authentic liturgy first and the subjective good of participation second, which is the correct order, Vatican II implies that the subjective good takes precedence and should even determine the content of the objective good. It is interesting to note as well that whereas Pius X speaks in this connection of holy mysteries and solemn public prayer, Vatican II simply speaks of the sacred liturgy. Of course, the phrase is not incorrect, but one sees a lessening of the note of majesty and mystery. So while superficially it may seem that the two documents are saying the same thing, a closer look shows that they diverge on a point of no small importance. Cardinal Lercaro blundered, therefore, in asserting that active participation is the fundamental principle of Pius X's pastoral and liturgical reform. Nor should we be surprised that Pius X's views are much more akin to those of his immediate predecessor, Leo XIII, who, in his splendid letter, Testem Benevolentiae, of 1899, teaches that the primary work or activity of the laity is to live as faithful Christians in the world and to raise up prayer to God, while the primary work of the clergy is to preach sound doctrine and to celebrate glorious liturgies in honor of God, the greatest and best. The scriptures teach us that it is the duty of all to be solicitous for the salvation of one's neighbor, according to the power and position of each. The faithful do this by religiously discharging the duties of their state of life, by the uprightness of their conduct, by their works of Christian charity, and by earnest and continuous prayer to God. On the other hand, those who belong to the clergy should do this by an enlightened fulfillment of their preaching ministry, by the pomp and splendor of ceremonies, and especially by setting forth that sound form of doctrine which St. Paul inculcated upon Titus and Timothy. The Church will be better off when we have a lot more of that sound form of doctrine and pomp and splendor of ceremonies, so that before everything else, the sanctity and dignity of the temple may be duly provided for, and in this way, the faithful may come to participate most fruitfully in the Holy Mysteries. Well, that was Peter Kwasniewski's article entitled how Vatican II elevated worshippers' active participation above worship of God. I think he makes a very good case. Um, here are a few more points. This issue of active participation has been, of course, rehashed zillions of times. I've done it myself on the blog. Uh, there is, of course, you know, firstly, the terminology problem, the difference between actuosa participatio or activa participatio, um, it has been stated that in Latin there are more than one word for what comes into the English language with the single word active. And I've argued uh, with others uh, that the use of active to translate actuosa has contributed to the ubiquitous confusion reigning in liturgical circles about what the council really desired for the faithful. 
today, active participation nearly always means that everyone has to sing everything, carry stuff, clap their hands, run around, and uh, so forth. And I say that what the council really wanted, first and foremost, if you just read the text, is a lively interior and spiritual participation. And then as a result of that, an outward expression of participation. Um, I stand on the principle that octuoso is really more of an interior sense of participation. Uh, the Council Fathers uh, could have used other words to convey a more exterior participation, but uh, in, short, in short, what the Church really means by active participation, I hold, is really an active receptivity that has nothing to do with being passive on the one hand, or being like really busy carrying stuff around during Mass. And, you know, there are those who want to um, clericalize the laity by making, giving them physically active chores, the chores of the clergy, as a matter of fact, in the name of active participation. I, actually, I think that this is a vile form of clericalism because it does not recognize the dignity of the baptized. It's almost as if you're, the, these priests are saying, in order for you to participate actively, I, the priest, will let you do the things that I do. Well, that's, that's terrible. Uh, it does not recognize the dignity of the baptized. They have their own role. And I think that that uh, also is echoed, uh, or you know, maybe rather than echoed, better explained, um, in a document that came out at the very apex of the 20th century liturgical movement at the end of the reign of Pius XII. Remember, you know, before very long after this, John XXIII is going to call this council, and the first document that comes out from the council is going to be about liturgy, right? So what is going on, you know, just before that happens uh, is very important. Well, the Sacred Congregation of Rites uh, issued... Uh, a document called De Musicam, uh, De Musicam Sacrum, and in it, it says that active participation, and it uses the Latin term actuosa participatio, active participation is perfect when sacramental participation is included. In this way, the document says, the people receive the Holy Eucharist not only by spiritual desire, but also sacramentally, and thus obtain greater benefit from this most holy sacrament. And it cites the Council of Trent and uh, Mediator Dei and so forth. What this means is that true active participation, what is described in this document as actuosa participatio, which is perfect, takes place when the baptized person receives the Eucharist in the state of grace. That's what that sacramental participation, not just by spiritual desire, but also sacramentally. You see, that's what that's driving at. True active participation begins with your baptismal character. That baptismal character makes it possible for you to receive what the Lord wants to give you. True active participation is characterized by an act of will founded on your baptismal character by which you knowingly and lovingly embrace what is occurring according to your role in the liturgy. And of course, that's different for priests than it is for lay people. But the principle is the same. We still have to do the same thing. The act of receptivity, that knowing and willing embrace of the sacred action, can then lead to outward expression in the appropriate way and at the appropriate moment. So what happens is that interiorly you are disposed to receive. You make an act of love, you make an act of will, which comes from also knowledge. You have to know what you're doing and you have to will it. You have to like reach out with your will and your mind and your heart and embrace it. And then what happens is that when you're in the state of grace, then you get up and then you physically process forward in that procession toward, please God, the communion rail. Then where, again, you kneel down, another act. You're not just still standing in a line, 
but then it's another physical action of kneeling down and then receiving receiving actively receiving is active receptivity receiving the eucharist so it starts with a foundation of a baptismal character then is with knowledge about what the church teaches and then willing to embrace it and then desiring and loving it and being in the state of grace then receiving holy communion actively with that interior activity it's exterior interior active receptivity you see that moment then of communion is the most perfect form of active participation and everything else takes you know second place to that so that's what happens in you know that's what happens at different times of mass too for example uh, let's you know think about the proclamation of the gospel holy church wants you to be actively receptive to everything that christ is trying to give you in the proclamation of the gospel remember the proclamation of the gospel in all the readings is a sacrificial act being raised back up to god by then we receive through which we receive from from the high priest uh, ineffable things well when the gospel is proclaimed you are not asked to read it aloud together with the priest you are asked to listen to it at the offertory there is a procession of gifts up to the altar well, this is where you join your own aspirations and desires and petitions and everything that you are to those gifts that are going to be offered. But you're not. But not everyone in the church is asked to rush up to the altar unless the priest is, you know, an idiot. Everyone is called upon by the priest, who is acting as the head of the assembly, the head of the body of Christ gathered there. He's altar Christus. He asks you then to unite your offerings and spiritual sacrifice sacrifices to his and you do that interiorly interiorly with an act of will not by physically going up and grabbing hold of the chalice with him you know there's nothing passive about listening carefully either to the readings or to the music or to the prayers of holy mass as a matter of fact listening with your mind and your will engaged is very difficult it is seriously active now you can do things and you can sing uh, for example or you can read with your mind a million miles away i think you probably had the experience of reading for a while and suddenly realize that you've been moving your 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 eyes down the pages and you've seen the words but you've really been thinking about something else your mind drifted and then when you go back and start over and read it yeah you recognize it yeah you read it but you really didn't engage it with your mind so you didn't grasp onto it and make it yours well the same thing can happen to people who when they're when they're singing maybe um you know hymns in a church or choir or or whatever you can be singing all the words uh, la 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 but you're actually thinking okay now what was it i was supposed to pick up at the store again it was there was some milk eggs something else what was it in the meantime the music is going on and you come to the final chords and well you if someone were looking looking at you they saw you singing maybe looking at the you know hymnal and following along but inside you you were somewhere else um conversely there's the the situation where someone might say would you please stop humming that song and you realize that without even thinking about it you were humming something or whistling something that was annoying the people around you see we to be really engaged is hard work being actively engaged with the action of the mass so as to be receptive to its fruits is true active participation and once that takes place then there can be an outward and physical participation at the proper times for example when it's time for the people to make a response or it's 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 more than just you know saying something when you are actively receiving what christ wants to give you during mass through your inward participation then those responses are your voice christ's voice 
acting, sounding off in your voice, founded on your baptismal character, when you respond in that kind of participation, Christ is making your voice his own. So, you know, not, and this, this baptism thing, this is very important. You know, a Muslim, for example, a Muslim who comes into a, a Catholic church can carry stuff around and clap and sing and do handstands or, you know, for whatever it's worth. But he does not receive any of the graces that the baptized deaf woman in her wheelchair receives when she is truly there in heart, mind, and soul. She might not be able to see everything or hear everything perfectly or, or, or carry something around, but she's really there in her heart, mind, and soul. That's an active participation that a lot of people, a lot of other people will never attain. So, to repeat, the perfect form of active participation is the active receptivity of the communicant in the state of grace at the moment of receiving the Eucharist. That's the perfect storm of baptismal character, heart, mind, and will, and outward physical participation in the form of the procession going forward, kneeling down and receiving. Now, all of this has implications for everything which is chosen for the church's sacred rites and worship. Proper understanding of active participation as active receptivity um, is going to have an impact on our choice of music, where we put our choir, how processions are organized, how the readings are handled, the selection of vestments, the organization of the elements of the sanctuary. Nearly everything that anything that you can think about Holy Mass is going to be impacted by this point. And that's that point, of course, that Peter wrote about, and I'll quote it again. Note here that Pius X is assuming that the faithful will be assimilated to the spirit of the liturgy itself. What it is, they also will be. What it is not, they can never become. That's a key point. This is at the heart of my watchword, we are our rights. The, that principle, which you've heard a million times, lex orandi, lex credendi, is commonly known, but I am not at all convinced that it is well understood, at least by clergy. You know, they may mouth it, who lex orandi, lex credendi, but they, they really do anything then to, to change the way they're doing things, they're, they're the sacred liturgical worship. You know, there's a, see, here's the point, there is a reciprocal relationship between how we worship and what we believe. If you change our rites, you will eventually change the belief of the people who participate in them. Conversely, if, you, if your beliefs change, you're going to change your rites. This is a simultaneous thing. It's going on, it's going on contemporaneously, and it is inexorable. It will happen. So consider the hydrogen bomb effect of imposing suddenly a new rite of mass artificially cobbled together by experts on desks instead of organically growing slowly out of the experience of the faithful, which has prayers from which certain concepts were systematically stripped out. For example, guilt for sin, expiation, judgment, all those kind of negative things were systematically edited out of the proper prayers in the Novus Ordo. Now remember, if you change the rites and prayers, you change the belief of the people. Today, belief in the Eucharist is at an all-time low, and we know the reasons why. Look at how funerals are, are celebrated as like the late... Uh, ex Extraordinary, ordinary uh, Bishop Morlino used to say they're celebrated like mini canonizations, right? It's all white. Uh, they are celebrations of life. Uh, it's all positive and so forth. But 
remember that for decades we heard during the consecration of the precious blood the words for you and for all rather than the correct from the Latin pro multis for you and for many or better the many it even at the consecration that bad translation made it sound like everyone goes to heaven our rites made it seem you know with all the white in the funerals and then those words and over decades and decades our rights made it seem like the church was saying that everyone goes to heaven. So today, that's what people think. And if that's the case, then who cares what the Eucharist is? So, we are our rights. Our Catholic identity is entirely wrapped up with how we celebrate our sacred liturgical worship. If we don't revitalize our worship, then our identity will remain enervated, vacated, lobotomized. And it'll get worse. And if that's so, if, if we don't really know who we are, see, if our identity is, you know, winds up that way through the, that, that Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi thing, if we're, we're going to wind up not having any idea who we are. In fact, that's what the research says. And if we don't know that, then consequences for us as Catholics are dire. Now, consider this from the, the uh, categories of ad intra and ad extra. The, the effect of all of this inside the church and then outside the church. Remember, there's this constant interplay between the church and the world, the larger world going on simultaneously, an enculturation thing. There's there, What we do as a church has effects inside, and then it affects the outside world. So if we don't know who we are, and we can't explain what we believe, and then live accordingly, especially, you know, living accordingly, especially by displaying what we believe in our rights, displaying in our rights our deep conviction, and simultaneously having then our conviction deepened by those rights, if we don't know who we are, then why should anyone listen to what we have to offer? Well, thank you for listening and your patience. Uh, please uh, pray for me as I will for you. This is Father John Solzman.